air emission incentive programs for the oil and gas industry. Just to take a quick look at um, what we'll be chatting about today, I'll go over a brief introduction, really why are we here today? Um, and then I will touch on a regulation overview, although that won't be the main goal of today's presentation. I will focus the bulk of the presentation today on what some of those in current incentive programs are. We'll do a high level overview on carbon credits and really just the way the carbon credits interact with some of the incentive programs that I'm chatting about today. And then I will get into a little bit more detail on um, the results and learnings from the uh, incentive applications that we've had the opportunity to support to date. So we've gotten a lot of recent experience with uh, supporting a lot of clients in this area. So we'll share some of what we've learned there through, uh, through some of the uh, processes that we've gone through. And then I'll summarize and kind of wrap up our presentation just with a little bit of a summary on how we can continue to support our clients in this area. So really, I mean, the reason that we're here today is because greenhouse gases have become such a major driving force uh, in executing our projects in the oil and gas industry. And I mean, the pushes really do um, mainly, I would say, to regulations and the provincial and federal commitments that have been made uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But it's also, um, it's also becoming more of a company's ESG uh, strategy to, to really ensure that they're promoting themselves when they're, when they're making efforts to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions uh, within this industry. So on my last webinar, I did chat a lot more about all of the specific regulations. I did a high level overview on about eight of the different regulations that really impact air emissions. So that's not going to be the focus today. The focus today is going to be the incentive programs that are out there to uh, support some of those uh, regulations and some of those legislative requirements that people are, are, are meeting today. So before I do get into the incentive, um, the incentive regulate or the incentive program overview, um, I do want to touch base on air emissions just because they do play such a key part in, in what we're all doing right now. So one of the things that we took out of feedback from our last presentation is that clients could still use a few additional tools um, to navigate what regulations apply to them when they're following provincial regulations versus federal regulations and really how some of the timelines come into play, how some of the incentive programs come into play. So I did pull together, um, or as a team, we pulled together a few documents uh, to assist our clients. And I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but I will show you um, a little bit of a sneak peek on some of these that we've uh, pulled together. So this is our air emission regulation timeline. And what we have here, as you can see along the left-hand side, we have a bunch of the major um, air emission regulations that are applicable today. So we have Directive 60 uh, from the AER, uh, BC's drilling and production regulation, the multi-sector air pollutant regulations. And then along the top of the, um, the table here, we have the, the dates that a lot of the, the changes are coming into impact. So, I mean, there's already been a lot of changes prior to 2021, but we want to highlight some of the key upcoming dates um, and just kind of have a clear format for people to look at when they're, when they're looking at what they have to achieve with regards to air emissions over the next few years. Um, in addition to that document, uh, after the last webinar, we did send out a bunch of PDFs um, for references for people. It was kind of a, a two-page a two document per regulation that was a high-level high overview. We did the same for the incentive programs. So as everybody knows, these things are just constantly changing. So we have taken the time to update all of those documents as well, and uh, those can be available to those who would like to utilize them as well. And then another document um, that we did pull together. This one is really just to highlight how some of these incentive programs tie into some of the legislative requirements that people are, uh, are meeting right now. So at the top of this table, we have um, our federal and our Alberta programs. In orange, we have the emission source that um, you're regulating. So carbon, methane, NOx, and BTEX. Uh, the blue boxes are all specific regulations that people have to follow, whether it's at a federal or a provincial level. And then in green, we've thrown in some of the incentive programs and how those incentive programs can help you achieve both regulatory compliance and then also potentially financially support some of the projects um, that you'll have going forward. 
So like I said, that's really all I'm going to do today for the air emission um, overview. Um, and I will get into the incentive programs now. So the five incentive programs that I'm going to talk about today are the Emission Reduction Fund, the Methane Technology and Implementation Program, the Baseline Reduction Opportunity Assessment, Energy Savings for Business, and the Clean Resource Innovation Network. So the Emission Reduction Fund, this is one that everybody has been, was really excited about. It was announced back in April uh, 2020, and everybody was really excited to see how this huge fund that the federal government announced would uh, apply to the oil and gas industry. So how the ERF is working is it's a Canada-wide program, and it's available for all oil and gas producers and midstream operators um, that meet their eligibility criteria. So this is run through Natural Resources Canada, and it's a $675 million fund. Um, and it's really available to anyone who's making emission reductions at their sites, whether it's through applying new technologies or changing their processes. The funding through this program is up to 75% of your eligible project costs. And the funding comes in the form of an interest-free, a five-year interest-free loan. Um, now, depending on the type of project that you have, whether it's an elimination project or a reduction project, and I'll differentiate between those two on the next slide, but depending on what type of project you have, um, if you're doing an elimination project, a portion of your loan may be forgiven. So anywhere from 10 to 50% of your loan may be forgiven by the federal government if you're actually eliminating emissions through your project. Um, the way that they determine whether it's 10% or 50% is um, based on the cost per ton to reduce your CO2 equivalents. So the first intake for this program opened in a bit of a whirlwind. I know a lot of people were kind of surprised because it seemed like in one day they announced, okay, we figured out what to do with our money. This is our program. The next day it opened. And I think a lot of people either, it took a little bit of time to, to hear that the program had opened, but then also just to acquaint themselves with whether they were eligible, what the requirements looked like. Um, so that first intake period was the month of November and the ERF group did receive a total of 22 applications uh, for 29 projects. And for that first intake period, they had $225 million available. So we haven't heard yet what the final numbers are on how much of that funding was utilized. Um, but I do understand that they did not um, they did not give out the full or they have not promised the full $225 million from that first intake period. What they did hear from industry was that it was too short of an intake period. People were just grasping what the program was. So the second intake period has opened. Um, it opened uh, January 18th. So we're, we're almost actually two weeks into the second intake period here. And it closes on March 19th. So for the second intake period, uh, they have available, uh, they've set aside $450 million and they are really expecting a significant increase in applications for this period. Now, one thing to note here is that there is a minimum project funding of $100,000 and a maximum was just increased to $40 million per company. So the first intake, it was $20 million per company, but they have decided to increase that. They announced it yesterday um, in a technical session that I was attending uh, with the ERF. They haven't put it into all their formal documentation yet, but I think that's great news, especially for some of our clients that uh, were able to do initial intakes um, and still had some projects left that they wanted to, uh, wanted to put through. Um, another thing to note is that per intake period, each company gets one application. So um, if you applied in the first intake period, you can apply again in the second. You get one application per intake period and your application can include lots of different projects. So you might have one facility where you're reducing tank emissions and 10 other facilities where you're switching your pneumatics to electrification. All of those projects would be combined together into one intake or into one application for your intake period. Um, one thing to note is if they do have any remaining funding after these first intake two intake periods, they will potentially open a third. Now, as I mentioned, there's a couple of different types of projects that they're accepting through 
uh, this program. So there's elimination projects and some of the examples that they give are the conservation of natural gas that was intentionally vented or flared, the development or upgrading of existing gas gathering and processing infrastructure in order to enable increased conservation, and exchanging your pneumatic devices that intentionally vent the atmosphere with zero bleeding electrical or instrument air driven devices. So those would all be considered that elimination group in which you can potentially um, not have to pay back a portion of your loan that you get through this funding program. Now on the reduction side, we have uh, the incinerating or flaring of natural gas that was previously vented. So they're really taking into consideration here the fact that methane has such a significantly higher global warming potential. So as long as you're reducing from methane to carbon dioxide, that can also uh, be included within this program. And then also just lowering the volume of natural gas that's being vented to atmosphere. So maybe you're optimizing some processes or making your site more efficient and it'll reduce your emissions. Um, that can also um, qualify through this program. So one thing to note about the two different types of elimination versus reduction projects here is if you do uh, do an elimination project and the ERF says, look, you don't have to pay back 25% of your project funding. Um, so that it basically becomes a 25% grant. Um, the only problem, the only issue that some people might have with that is it does negate your opportunity to be able to generate carbon credits from that project. Whereas if you just take the funding as a loan and you can choose to do that, whether you're doing an elimination or a reduction project, you can choose to just say, no, I only want the loan for this project. Um, then you are still able to generate carbon credits. And I will high level chat about that a little bit more when I get to the carbon credit slide, but that's just something to note um, when we're talking about the ERF fund. Now I'll move into the methane technology and implementation program. So these, this, pro, this uh, program is really designed for projects that are directly reducing your methane. They're not as interested in your overall CO2E uh, equivalent reduction. So th these are methane specific projects. This one is a $25 million fund. And this program is facilitated through Carbon Connect International. It is open for applications and it's been open for a couple of months now. Um, I did chat with uh, the uh, Carbon Connect International facilitators this week and they said that there is still funding available, even including some of the applications that are under review. So they strongly encourage that people still get applications in um, while the funding lasts. Uh, with the MTIP program, uh, up to 50% of your total eligible project costs can be provided uh, back to you as a grant um, to fund your project. There is a maximum of $1 million per owner, and there is a minimum project um, incentive value of $10,000, which means a minimum project total cost of $20,000. Now, this program is stackable with other funding programs. So, for example, the ERF, that's one area that people are seeing a lot of um, a lot of ways to stack those two programs between the ERF and the MTIP. Um, so between the two of those, you're actually able to um, stack them to a total of 90% of your project costs. So making a lot of a lot of projects really viable when you see numbers like that. Um, and of course, you must still be able to meet. They have some eligibility criteria, such as um, like this program is an Alberta-based program, so you do have to be a uh, and it does have to be an Alberta facility that's subject to Directive 60 requirements. Um, and you also can't be a large emitter under the tier program, but the aggregate facilities under, under the tier program are able to utilize this as well. And then again, one thing that I always want to note when you're looking at these incentive programs is that if you do choose to accept the 50% funding from the MTIP program, you are choosing to forfeit basically generating any carbon credits uh, for that project. Now with MTIP, um, they have very specific project types that they've listed as being almost pre-approved under this program. Um, it doesn't mean that if your project doesn't fall under this list, it's not applicable, but there's basically an extra process that you go through where you do an eligible technology application first, and then you'd proceed uh, secondly with your typical MTIP uh, funding application. 
So the eligible project types under uh, MTIP are when you're looking at your pneumatic devices, you have your um, electrification of your devices, uh, switching high bleed to low bleed, uh, switching from instrument gas to instrument air, and then also your vent gas capture from pneumatic devices. With compressors, you're looking at uh, vent gas capture and utilization. With hydrocarbon storage tanks, uh, you're looking at basically destructing those vapors in a clean combustor and or the installation of a VRU. And then for um, other and some of the non-routine uh, applications that they've seen so far, there's vent gas reduction from desanding or desanders, uh, surface casing vent gas flow and gas migration projects, casing gas conservation, and then also casing gas capture with separation process and destruction. So one thing that the MTIP facilitators did just announce um, in January, um, which is a little bit different from what we had heard previously, is um, a slight change in that, that could impact your um, ability to uh, generate carbon credits as well for the same project. So one thing that they did mention is um, if you do go through with the MTIP process, you apply for the project, you get your approval, you accept your funding. If you choose to pay back the MTIP funding by June 31st, 2021, so not a lot of time there, but if you did choose to pay it back, you could also uh, generate carbon credits for the same project. So just one thing to note, because people are maybe seeing that there's an advantage to accepting the money to, to facilitate or to move along some of those upfront capital costs. And then once they're able to maybe start generating carbon credits through their project, they pay the money back and then they accept financing that way instead, or they're able to get some funding that way instead. Um, and then another update that just happened in January is that MTIP announced that if you have a technology that's not on the approved list, however, you did apply to the ERF fund and your technology was approved was approved by ERF, you don't have to go through their eligible technology uh, list or, or, or application. So that's something to note as well. Of course, you might want to reach out to the Carbon Connect facilitators um, for your specific project, but I know that that applied to us and a couple of, or, or to a couple of our clients. So they were happy to hear they didn't have to go through a second full process with MTIP this time around. So now I'll switch gears and I'll chat about the Energy Savings for Business program. So uh, this is facilitated through Emission Reduction Alberta. Um, they recently also just had their Shovels Ready program. Um, that one is closed now, but now this one is opening on February 1st, 2021. So this is a $55 million fund and it's uh, designed to support small and medium scale industrial and commercial businesses uh, for basically using energy efficiency technologies. So this is not just specific to the energy industry. And when I show you some project examples on the next slide, you'll see that um, it's maybe aimed a little bit more at some other industries, but could definitely be applicable, especially if you have some of these projects that have been sitting on the back burner. So with this program, uh, it's up to $250,000 that's available to a maximum of $500,000 per, sorry, 250 per project to a maximum of 500,000 per company. And they're, they're planning to fund 15 to 30% of your project, um, kind of depending on what the project is. Um, they are expected to be open for about six to 12 months after they launch on February 1st, um, but it basically until the funds run out. So this is another first come first serve basis um, as far as funding goes. Now, some of the examples that are a little bit relevant to us as well, they did have some other ones on their list, but I, I narrowed it down. Um, some HVAC projects, so this could include the installation of efficient boilers or pipe insulation, um, upgrades to fan and pump motors, so installation of VFDs um, would be included in this, installation of electronic or automation systems for temperature, airflow, lighting, um, upgrading old lighting systems through the use of automation or others, um, installation of alternate on-site power sources, so ways to, to really bring up the efficiency of a facility there. And then also just your building facility or your building efficiency, so like insulation, building envelope, air sealing, all of those types of projects would be um, relevant under this program. 
Um, with this program, these are just examples. So this is a list of pre-approved projects. If you have any other um, examples of ways that you're using less energy at your facilities, there is the potential for those to qualify under this program as well. So it's definitely something we can look into. So this next program is the Baseline Reduction Opportunity Assessment. This is facilitated through Carbon Connect International as well. So the same facilitator as MTIP. It's a $10 million fund, and the goal of this program is really to support small and medium-sized uh, oil and gas operators to conduct uh, their assessments out in the field. So the program's open for Alberta operators that have less than 60,000 barrel of oil equivalent per day, um, and the funding maximum is $200,000 per operator. Now the types of assessments that you can get covered under this program, and it's pretty good, it's up to 80% of your eligible expenses are covered, which um, is, is pretty significant in terms of some of these incentive programs. Um, the types of assessments that they'll cover are device and equipment inventory, leak detection assessment, and extended flow and gas composition analysis. So they do have, um, you do have to use a pre-approved vendor to do those field assessments, and they have a list on their website um, of people that you can use, and it's mostly uh, the field companies that you're seeing that can go out and actually do the field, uh, the field measurement and quantification um, of your emission sources. Um, with this program, one thing that's really nice to note or important to note are these are assessments that you have to do anyways to meet your Directive 60 requirements. So you already have to do your one to three leak detection surveys a year. Um, you have to be, you have to have your detailed uh, device and equipment inventory as a part of your MRRCP plan through the AER. So really you're getting $200,000 to complete some tasks that you potentially had to do anyways um, as a part of your compliance with, with Directive 60. So I think it's a really great place to take advantage of uh, some of these programs that are out there doing something that you have to do anyways um, for compliance reasons. The Clean Resource Innovation Network. So this is a federal program. It's focused on oil and gas innovation. And really this program, I would say, is definitely more uh, geared towards the technology providers, the technology vendors, and research support. However, um, it's a big fund. I mean, it's an $80 million fund, and there might be some ways for the oil and gas owners and operators to also participate in this. Um, they've said that they're going to release a series of challenges, bigger and smaller challenges, um, to kind of get people excited about some new technology that's coming out. Um, they might release challenges based on the, their technology readiness level, so whether some technologies are right in the early development stages or if some are ready for deployment. Um, I think one of the areas that pot potentially um, owners and operators of oil and gas sites might be able to get involved is if they want to, you know, step in for some pilot projects, maybe they want some of that new technology deployed at their site. Often there's some financial benefits to supporting programs like this uh, with regards to being a little bit of a test site for them as well. So the details on this one are still coming. I haven't seen any of the specific challenges get released yet, but I still wanted to highlight this one, even though I don't know if it'll be, you know, as, as beneficial to some of the people that are, that are listening to the presentation today. So now that I've, like, I've gone over all of the incentive programs that I was planning to chat about, um, but it's important not to neglect that carbon credits uh, can also be another really great way to fund emission reduction projects. So the way that the carbon credits work are carbon credits are generated uh, by voluntarily reducing your CO2 equivalent emissions um, beyond what a, what a regulation states that you have to do. Um, within Alberta, these do have to fall under the tier regulations and they do have to follow an approved uh, quantification protocol under the tier regulation. So the most utilized protocol within the energy industry right now is the one for uh, reducing your emissions from pneumatics. Um, so that's a common one that a lot of people are taking advantage of and generating some, a lot of carbon credits from. Uh, you can potentially generate carbon credits anywhere from a couple years up to eight years uh, for a project that's reducing, um, that's electrification or instrument air basically for pneumatics from high bleed. 
Um, carbon credits can come from both new site designs as well as for retrofits. So that's something else to note. And the reason why, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I'm um, an expert on all of the carbon systems that are out there, um, but why I do think it's important to mention it right now is just because accessing some of the funding for some of the other incentive programs um, can eliminate your opportunity to sell carbon credits. And really where a lot of people are seeing benefits is where they can be stackable with programs. So I really think it's important that when you have an emission reduction project, let's look at them together. Let's see what your best options are to get your best bank or your best your best bang for your buck really when it comes to emission reduction. So like I said, these programs can be stackable. You can potentially get a loan to get your upfront capital costs covered. And then once you're able to generate some carbon credits for some of those projects, specifically the pneumatics, uh, the pneumatic projects, um, then you're able to get your funding or, or earn some revenue uh, that way going forward. So I'll switch gears here a little bit and I'll talk a little bit about what the application processes have looked like to date. So like I said, um, I'll go over some results on the next slide, but we have had the opportunity to support a lot of these applications over the last few months. And although each application has been unique, there's definitely some common features. So some of the common features are there's always some project and technical descriptions. Um, obviously, the facilitator, whoever is providing the funding, wants to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, what your technology looks like. Um, they also always ask some, some questions about your applicant uh, background information. So as a oil and gas owner operator, um, they might ask you for your financial records. Um, they want security of funding to fund the remaining portion of your project. So, for example, if you're applying through MTIP and MTIP, you're hoping to get 50% of your uh, project funded, they want to understand for sure that the applicant can fund the other 50% of the project uh, if it gets approved. Um, and then they also just have questions around what are your policies as the company? Do you have mission statements? What's your background? Um, questions like that. Um, two pieces that we've seen on every application to date is the cost estimates and a project schedule. These are obviously really important because they want to understand that, um, I mean, they're usually paying a percentage of your cost estimate back to you. So it's really important to have your cost estimate nailed down uh, to the level of detail that they need. Um, and then same with your project schedule. So the project schedules um, really come into play for some of the programs because they have definitive start and end dates. They do sometimes want a project to be able to be constructed and up and running by a certain date. So those are two really key components of an application. And I think one thing that we've noticed um, to date is that they want them to be fairly detailed. So with the cost estimates, you're looking at a class three for the ERF program and around at least a class three level of detail uh, for the other programs as well. So they want to make sure that you've done enough planning, enough of that initial um, design engineering that you know what you're looking for and the project will, will be able to move forward um, should you get approval through one of these programs. And then also there's just some getting used to the various online platforms that are used for the submission. Um, each, each proponent seems, or each uh, facilitator seems to have a different way format um, that they want you to submit the application in. So looking at some of the results that we've had in this area. Um, recently we've been able to, we've had the opportunity, which has been great, um, to support the applications to the IECCUS fund. So that one is closed. Um, that's why I didn't mention it previously, but we were able to support an application there um, to the MTIP program, the ERF program, and the ERA Shovels Ready program. Uh, specifically, we we're really excited that for the ERF program alone, we actually supported 25% of the submissions that NRCAN received. So that gave us a huge range of projects to look at. Um, we saw a VRU addition, a heat exchanger addition, compressor seal pot gas capture and reuse. Uh, we saw lots of projects for new pipelines or associated equipment to facilitate gas conservation where it hadn't been economical to do so uh, before these programs came in. And then also some proprietary new technologies. If the projects, so we've just kind of started to see some of the approvals coming in from this uh, first intake period. And um, if all of the projects are to move forward, we're really excited that um, from the applications we've 
uh, helped submit, there would be 2.5 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year uh, removed from the atmosphere. So that's a story that we're happy to tell and we hope our clients are help happy to tell uh, the same story. So some of the things that we've learned from these applications. Um, we've learned that creating streamlined templates to use for the applications are a key feature to make them efficient. So we've taken everything that we've learned from our first intake period and we've really we've created uh, templates for cost estimates, project schedule, GHG calculations. Um, for the ERF program, there's a business plan and a baseline opportunity assessment. So we've created templates to facilitate working through those more effectively. And then also just some of the general administrative and technical write-ups that all of the applications seem to have. Having that solid template in place, I think, really improves the efficiency of the process and um, will really improve it for the second intake for some of these programs as well. Another thing that we uh, found was that collaborating with the facilitators was really crucial. Um, so we had a lot of back and forth with um, the NRCAN people and with the Carbon Connect International people. And we found that because each project is so unique and because they're also just rolling out information as they get it and they're not really sure what works yet either, um, they're happy to have some feedback back and forth. So we're able to provide feedback to them. They're able to provide feedback to us. And I think that that led to more streamlined applications that really contained the information that those facilitators wanted to review. So we feel like that was a, an important piece and we'll definitely uh, continue that for, for future applications. And then another piece of this was just to make sure as much as possible, you can allow enough time to complete your applications. So as I mentioned, I know the first intake was a bit of a whirlwind. Everybody was just scrambling to get their applications in under this brand new program. Um, and, and, but really what we've seen is that it's, it's a process. So it's a process to get all of the documents together that you need for these applications. Um, one thing that we've done is we've kind of taken an application, um, broken it down literally component by component, and it shows what, um, what we would be able to support as an engineering company versus what we still would need from our clients side, some of the financial information and the background information. And it's just a really prescriptive process to go through. Um, to, to make sure that you're hitting those timelines that you need because it was a little bit of a scramble for some people in the last app, uh, in the last uh, intake for the ERF application anyways. And uh, we just wanna say it's not an overnight process. Definitely allow some time uh, to work your way through these applications. Now, really in summary, I just wanna say that um, we're, we're really hearing about the challenges that industry is facing, uh, staying on top of the evolving regulations, staying on top of the incentive programs, when they open, when they close, all of the changes, the emails that they're constantly sending out to update you on the status of programs. Um, so we just wanna drive home that we're here to help you uh, navigate all of that. We're here to help you navigate the regulations, the incentive programs. We're here to help you assess which programs are right for you and for your project and which ones are the best economically uh, to move your project along. And I mean, really with regards to that, um, in addition, we're here to support our clients in, in developing their corporate strategy with regards to why. So why are you reducing your emissions? Is it because you have to to, to meet compliance? Because that's a fair answer. Or is it you want to have um, you want to boost your ESG strategy and really attract additional investment, or maybe you just want to tell a great story on social media about all of the great work you're doing with emission reduction. All of those are possible, and I mean, if you guys give us a little bit of an idea of what way you're going with corporate strategy, then we're happy to help tailor solutions uh, that fit within your within your company strategy. <laughs>